Okay guys, today we're going to start reviewing for the chemistry final and also for the state final. They're going to be comprehensive exams, which means they cover all of the information that we learned in chemistry this whole year. And so what I'd like to do today is, is focus on first quarter. It's been a long time since, uh, you know, August, September, and October, and we might have forgot some of those topics. So. The purpose of this book, making this booklet today, is to review some of the most important topics from that uh, first quarter in chemistry. So before we start, I wanted to show you a picture of the finished product. And uh, the book that you're going to make today is just made out of a piece of paper, and you're going to fold it so that it's into this uh, like a little mini booklet. I wanted you to take note uh, of the page numbers. This cover page is page number one. On the back of the cover page would be two, then you got three, four, five, six, seven. If you do it correctly, and if you make this book correctly, the back cover of your book should be page eight. So first I'm going to teach you how to fold the paper so that you can make this booklet, and then we'll go through what you're going to put on each page. All right, so to make it, step one says you're going to get one sheet of white paper an 8.5 8 by 11, 8.5 by 11, just a regular sheet of paper. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to do a series of folds. And whenever you see the dotted line here on step two, that's where you're going to fold the piece of paper. So wherever you see dotted lines, you're going to make a fold there. This first fold is going to be lengthwise here, which a lot of people call the hot dog fold. So go ahead and fold your paper the long way with a hot dog fold. And make a nice sharp crease. Get your fingernail, uh, make it nice and, and crisp there. Okay, step three is to fold it in half again. So now your paper should look like this, but now we're going to make a fold in half again. So let's do that. Okay, now go to step four. Your paper should look like this right now. You're gonna make another fold. So fold it in half again. And now we're to step five. You've got a little, um, what looks like a little booklet, okay? But it's, it's not a book yet. We're gonna do some more to it. So let's go to step six. And it says to unfold everything. So unfold your piece of paper, open it back up, and you should have, if you folded it correctly, eight rectangular boxes here. Now, what we are going to do, uh, step seven is one of the more complicated steps, so I'm going to take some time explaining it. So you're going to fold this, your paper in half, this time the hamburger fold, so kind of the short way. And notice on the diagram here that this side, this left side, is the folded edge. So make sure that you have your folded edge on the left side here. Now what you're going to do is use scissors to make a cut. But before you do that, I want to make sure that you get that exactly how it's supposed to be. Notice with your paper in the hot dog fold, there's a center cross right here. This center cross. Now what you're going to do with your scissors is you're going to cut along the folded edge where this red line is. So you're going to go to this center cross and stop right there. So grab a pair of scissors if you have some. Grab a pair of scissors and make that cut. Now hopefully you're cutting along that folded side, not the open side, but the folded side here. And now, let's go to step eight. It says to unfold your paper. And what you'll notice when you do that, you're going to notice that there's now an opening in your paper right here where we cut. Now, we're going to fold it in half, the hot dog fold again, so just the long way. And it looks like it does in step nine here. Notice, it's got arrows here. You're supposed to push these sides 
in toward the middle. And what you'll notice is that this opening here kind of looks like a diamond. But as you push it, that diamond should get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we're just going to keep pushing. Now let's go to step 10 and see what we're supposed to do. So keep pushing the edges together. Make that diamond here very big. So again, you're pushing these toward the middle. And keep pushing it so that, they're, that it uh, actually folds over on itself. So like it says in step 11, fold one edge toward the slit and then the opposite side will fold over the edge. So just keep pushing it together and fold it over on itself. And now you've made a nice little booklet. Okay, so lay your book down on your desk and get those creases nice and sharp. Before we start with the review, I want to make sure of something. Your booklet, booklet should have eight pages. This title page, now I want you to do this with a pen or pencil, just real small, put the page number here. The title page is one. Now the back side of the title page, the inside cover, is two. That means this one will be three, four would be on the back of that, then five, six is on the back of that, and seven. And then if you did it correctly, the very back of your booklet should be page eight. So if you've got eight pages, you're ready to go. If not, you've made an incorrect fold somewhere. So go back in the video, rewatch it, and try to make the folds um, correct. And try to get a little booklet with eight pages. That's when you know you did it right. Okay, so let's start the review process. Let me, let me make this a little wider. All of this information that's on this, on this slide goes on page one. So you're going to have to write pretty small. I want you to title page one, Chemistry, Review of First Quarter. And then you're going to put all of this writing on the first page. So you're going to have to write kind of small. So as you're writing, I'm going to talk and kind of review what we talked about. So way back at the beginning of the school year, we started by talking about scientists who contributed to our knowledge of atoms. We started with this guy, Democritus. Democritus was a Greek philosopher. He lived in ancient Greece. It's over 2,000 years ago. He was the first person to start thinking about atoms. He imagined, and he did this thought experiment where you imagine matter, and if you cut it in half, and you kept cutting that piece of material in half again and again and again and again and again, he said you would eventually reach the point to which you couldn't cut it in half again. And he called that smallest unit of, of matter, he called it an atom. And like it says at the bottom here, atom in Greek means not able to be divided. And so that's where the word atom comes from. It's from Democritus. Now, of course, atoms can be divided. We know that we can split the atom, but Democritus didn't know that at his time. And he was the first person to start thinking about matter as composed of atoms. Okay, then the, uh, we went through this period called the Dark Ages, and nobody really progressed this idea of matter and, and it being built up of atoms until we got into the Renaissance or the Enlightenment period. One of the scientists who started studying chemistry again was John Dalton. John Dalton said that different atoms can combine in certain proportions. For example, if you look at the water molecule, it always has two hydrogens and one oxygen. No matter where you find water in the universe, it's always going to have two hydrogens and one oxygen. So that certain proportion of two to one is always present. Okay, then we went and we talked about J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson is uh, famous. He discovered electrons. He did this with a very famous experiment. It's called the cathode ray tube, where he had this big glass tube and he passed electricity through it. Well, what he did was put a magnet next to that glass tube, and what he noticed was that these, this beam 
would be attracted to the positive side of the magnet. So that beam would, was bent up toward the positive side of the magnet. Well, it told him that whatever those particles were, that they were negatively charged, and he called them electrons. And so up to this point, that's the only particle that had been discovered, was electrons. And he called his model of the atom plum pudding model, and those plums were the electrons. Well, then we took it farther with Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford discovered the nucleus, so the very center of the atom. That's what nucleus means, is very center. He did this by conducting the gold foil experiment, where he shot some alpha particles, which are positively charged particles, at this very thin sheet of gold foil. And the results from that experiment told him that the nucleus of the atom was very small, very dense, but it was positively charged. And so he discovered the nucleus and protons. Niels Bohr took it farther. He said that electrons travel around the nucleus in circular paths called energy levels. And then finally we talked about Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrödinger. These two scientists came up with the most correct model of the atom that we still use today called the electron cloud model. They found that electrons, like Bohr said, they found that they're really not traveling around in circular predictable paths. We can't really predict what electrons are doing, so they call it a cloud. So the electron cloud model of the atom, which we still think is the most correct model of the atom today. Okay, so hopefully you have all of that written down on page one. Now let's go to page two. We then learned about the structure of the atom. We said that the atom is made up of three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now I'm going to require that you know a lot about these particles. For example, their charge. A proton is positively charged. It does have mass, but the mass of a proton is very small. It's not like you can figure out its mass by putting it on, the electric, on an electric balance here. So it's got its own unit. It's called an atomic mass unit. So the proton does have mass. It has one AMU, or atomic mass units. Another thing I want you to remember about protons is that the number of protons tells you the element's atomic number. So when you look at the periodic table, and for example, carbon has the atomic number of six, that's how many protons are in its nucleus. So think about that. The elements are really arranged based on how many protons are in their nucleus. Hydrogen has one, so its atomic number is one. All the way to 118 on the periodic table. All right, now let's talk about neutrons. Neutrons have no charge, but they do have mass. They have the same mass as a proton, one atomic mass unit. So they're neutral particles, they do have mass. Let's go to the electron. The electron is negatively charged. It does have, technically it does have mass, but this is 0 0.0005 AMUs. 1 over 1836 is 0 .0005 AMUs. So they do have mass, but it would take 2,000 electrons to equal the mass of a proton or a neutron. And so technically, if you remember when I was talking about electrons, we were just going to say they had no mass. They do have a little bit of mass, but very, very small. Where do the electrons, where can you find them? They hang out in this place called the electron cloud. And they're very organized around in the electron cloud. They're organized in energy levels and orbitals. We learned about the S, P, D, and F orbitals. All right, now let's get the structure of the atom down. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, the very center of the atom. Now think about these two particles. They're the only two particles with significant mass. 
So neutrons plus protons in the nucleus, if you add them together, that tells you the mass number for the element. So neutrons plus protons equals the mass number. That's easy to remember because they're the only two particles with mass. And they're found in the nucleus. Okay, electrons are found in this space around the nucleus called the electron cloud. They're organized into energy levels and orbitals. So one thing that I want to make clear here, the nucleus is at the center of the atom and it's very small. Okay, the nucleus is very small, but guess what? That's where all of the mass of the atom is located. So it's very small, very massive, that means it's very dense. Then you've got the electron cloud. The electron cloud surrounds the nucleus and this is where the electrons hang out. Okay, hopefully you've got everything on page two. We're gonna to go to page three. And I want you to title page three, Atomic Numbers. And let's fit all of this information on page three. We spend a lot of time talking about atomic numbers. So let's first of all start with what atomic number means. The atomic number of an atom tells you the number of protons. For example, if you look at the periodic table, oxygen, its atomic number is eight. That tells you oxygen has eight protons in its nucleus. So the periodic table is arranged according to the atomic number, which is the number of protons. Now let's go to mass number. This one's easy for me to remember because when I think of mass, the only two particles with mass are neutrons and protons. If we want to determine the mass number for an, for an atom, we take the neutrons plus the protons, and that tells us its mass number. If you look at the periodic table, the mass number is really the atomic number rounded to the nearest whole number. Or I mean, it's the atomic weight rounded to the nearest whole number. So oxygen underneath it is 15.9994. If you round the atomic weight to the nearest whole number, that would be 16. That means oxygen's mass number is 16. All right, now let's talk about the number of neutrons. This is the one that's tricky for students, and they always forget this one. The number of neutrons, here's how you find it. You take the mass number and you subtract off the protons. You take the mass number and subtract off the protons, and what's left is the number of neutrons. So here's another way of saying that. If oxygen's mass number is 16, you take the mass number and subtract off its protons. How many protons does oxygen have? Its atomic number is eight. So you subtract off that eight, and that's still eight left over. It's got eight neutrons. So it would have eight neutrons and eight protons. Now the electrons. The electrons is pretty easy. You just gotta remember that electrons are negative. They've got to equal what the protons are. So if there's 20 protons, there's got to be 20 electrons. So really the atomic number, again, will tell you the number of electrons. For example, oxygen, its atomic number is 8. So it's got 8 protons, it's got to have 8 electrons. Now, we learned about this chemical symbol, and it's a way for chemists to write all of these atomic numbers in one concise space. And so let's talk about the chemical symbol for a second. For an element, it is usually a one-letter or two-letter abbreviation for that element. CA is for calcium. And then there's a number at the top left, which is called the mass number. Again, protons plus neutrons are the ones with mass, make up the mass number. Down at the bottom left, you've got the atomic number, which is the number of protons. So it's got 20 protons, that's its atomic number. And then underneath is the atomic weight. Again, if you round this to the nearest whole number, that's going to be the mass number. So 40.08 rounded to the nearest whole number is 40, that's its mass number. But how would you determine the number of neutrons? It's easy if it's in this notation because you just take the mass number, subtract the atomic number, which is the protons, and that gives you 20. 
So calcium must have 20 neutrons. 20 neutrons, 20 protons, add them together, you get 40 for the mass number. Okay, hopefully you have everything written down on page 3. Let's go to page 4. I want you to title this page Isotopes. And everything on this page needs to fit on page 4. So let's review. What isotope? What is an isotope? Well, they're atoms with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons can change. And when it changes, we call it an isotope. But the number of protons doesn't change, and the protons determines what element it is. So it's still the same element, but it's got different number of neutrons. That's what an isotope is. Here are some examples. We have uranium. Uranium-235 and uranium-238. Now notice how the protons, the atomic number, is still 92. It didn't change. So our element is still uranium. But what changed was the mass number. What's the difference? between 235 and 238. Well, this uranium, uranium-238, has three more neutrons. And so what if I asked you which one had more mass? Uranium-238 or uranium-235? Hopefully you're thinking to yourself, uranium-238 has more mass because it has three more neutrons, and they do have mass. Chemists can write isotopes a different way as well, where they use the chemical symbol with a hyphen followed by a number. So when you see this C-12, that's for carbon-12, and the 12 is telling you the mass number. So that's carbon-12, and this is carbon-14. These are isotopes of each other because this one has two more neutrons. Now the atomic weight, which you see at the very bottom of the, of the symbol on the periodic table, is usually a number with a big decimal place on it. And the reason for that is that atomic weight is the average weight of all the, the isotopes of that element. So and usually when you take the average of something, you get a decimal point. So for example, oxygen we just showed you was 15.999. That's an average weight of all of the isotopes for oxygen. All right, hopefully you've got page four filled out. Let's go to page five. I want you to title page five, radiation. So let's start with what the definition for radiation is. It is the rays and particles emitted by an unstable nucleus. So sometimes the nucleus, either because of too many protons or too many neutrons, this neutron to proton ratio, it gets out of whack and it can make the nucleus unstable. So if there's too many protons, think about that, they're positively charged, they want to repel each other. Well when you get too many protons next to each other in that tight space of the nucleus, sometimes it becomes unstable and it wants to break apart. When that happens, it gives off rays or particles in an attempt to get more stable. So we talked about three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. These are the Greek letters for alpha, for beta, and for gamma. Notice gamma is kind of a funny looking Y symbol here. You need to know a lot about these three types of radiation. Here's what I would like you to know. For alpha, the symbol is 42HE. The reason for that is alpha particles have two protons and two neutrons. It has really nothing to do with helium, but it's the same thing as a helium nucleus. So two protons, two neutrons. You need to remember that alpha particles are positively charged. They've got two protons, so that's what makes them positive. Also, what I want you to remember about alpha is that they're the least penetrating. These are the least dangerous. In fact, they can even be stopped by a piece of paper. They're not very powerful. Beta. 
What I want you to remember about beta is that its symbol is 0 minus 1 e. If you remember back in first quarter we talked about beta particles, they're kind of the funny one where the neutron in the nucleus is converted to a proton and an electron. It keeps the proton and then it shoots out that electron and so that's why it's given the symbol E because a beta particle really is a high energy electron. Because it's an electron it has a negative charge. In terms of penetrating power it's kind of medium. Now let's talk about gamma. Gamma rays are the most dangerous, but here's how gamma rays, here's the symbol for a gamma ray, 0, 0, G. Some chemistry textbooks use this Y symbol and some use a G symbol. So I'll show you both ways. Remember that gamma rays have no charge, but they are the most penetrating. They'll go through concrete. They can go through your, your, your body and they break the DNA inside of your cells and sometimes if that DNA is broke in a very important gene that controls the cell cycle, it can lead to cancer. And so gamma rays are the most dangerous for that reason, they're the most penetrating. So alpha is positively charged, beta is negatively charged, and gamma has no charge. Okay, so what if you have some radioactive material? How long is it going to stick around? It's measured in what is called the half-life. Half-life is the time it takes for a radioactive substance to decay to one half of its mass. So if you had 10 grams of a radioactive substance, how long does it take to go to 5 grams? This would be its half-life. And it's different for every radioactive isotope, it can be different. Okay, hopefully you have everything written down on page five. Let's go to page six. Page six, I want you to title nuclear, Ra nuclear Reactions. Nuclear Reactions. We learned about two of them. We learned about fission and fusion. And it's very important that you know the difference, so let's contrast them. Let's start with fission first. In fission reactions, is where you have a large atom and it's split into two smaller atoms. So if you think about fission, look at the bottom of the periodic table. That's where all the large unstable atoms are. If they're unstable, it's easier to split them and they make two smaller atoms that are more stable. When you do that, it releases a large amount of energy. I also want you to write this down as well. Where do you see fission reactions happening today? And they're happening in nuclear power plants. This is how the nuclear power plants are getting the energy to heat the water in those plants, which turns to steam, which turns the, the turbine and produces electricity. So nuclear power plants use fission reactions. Okay, now let's contrast that to fusion. Fusion is kind of the opposite, where it's two small atoms fuse into a larger atom. For example, you can get hydrogen, very small, it's the smallest atom, and, and uh, if, if the temperature is high enough, those hydrogen atoms are moving fast enough to slam into each other and make a larger atom. If two hydrogen atoms fuse, because they have one proton each, you're going to make an element with two protons. And that's going to make helium. So where do fusion reactions happen today? They happen in stars. In fact, our star, the sun, is burning by this nuclear reaction right here. Hydrogen is fusing to make helium and releases a lot of energy, even more than fission. And so, know the difference between fission and fusion. We talked about balancing nuclear reactions, where we have this radioactive isotope, it's unstable, so in an attempt to become more stable, it gives off radiation. I want you to be able to identify what kind of radiation was this, and this was an alpha particle. 
and you should be able to predict the product that's going to form. This side was 88 for the atomic number, so that means the other side has got to total to 88. Well, the alpha particle is 2, what's left is 86. And so that's how you can identify what atom is going to form. You can do the same thing for the mass number on the top. The left has got to balance out with the right. What type of radiation is given off right here? Hopefully you're thinking to yourself that that is a beta particle. A little trick with the beta particles because its atomic number is minus 1. Well, if we've got 19 on the left, we've got to have 19 total on the right. So if you've already got minus 1, you need 20 here. And so that's how you would identify that calcium is going to form there. Remember that gamma is not a particle at all, so it doesn't change nuclear reactions. It's not a particle, but it does have energy and a lot of it, so um, you just remember that. All right, that's page six. Let's go to page seven. Page seven, I want you to title light. We talked about light, and so light is emitted when an electron returns to its ground state. So which particle of the atom is responsible for emitting light? It's the electrons. And here's how that happens. If you have an, an atom here, its electron is in energy level one or its ground state. If you give that atom energy, either by passing electricity through it or maybe lighting it on fire, it can absorb that energy. And it does so, it moves the electron up to a higher energy level, which is called the excited state. But it's not very stable. It doesn't like to be there. It wants to come back down. But in order to come back down, it's got to give back that energy that it absorbed. Because you can't create or destroy energy. So it gives back that energy in the form of light. And light travels through the air as a wave. And so we studied waves. Some of the wave characteristics that I hope that you will remember is that this top wave has a longer wavelength. The wavelength is the distance from equivalent points on the wave. So example, crest to crest, that's the wavelength. If it has a longer wavelength, it's going to have lower energy or less energy. If the wave has a shorter wavelength, smaller wavelength equals higher energy. I should also talk about frequency. Which wave has a higher frequency, top or bottom? The bottom wave is more frequent, it goes up and down more. So that's going to have more energy, it's got more, it has a higher frequency, so it has more energy. We talked about all the different colors of light. Roy G. Biv is a great way to remember all the colors of light. Red has the least energy. Violet has the most energy. Okay, so just a quick recap. Is light emitted when it goes up to its excited state, or is it emitted when it comes back down to its ground state? And hopefully you're saying, when it comes back down, that's when light is emitted. Okay, let's go to the final page, the back cover of your book page 8, I want you to title it Electrons, and you're going to have to write pretty small because all of this has got to fit on the back cover. We kind of finished up quarter one by talking about electrons. The most important electrons are called valence electrons. They're the electrons in the highest energy level or the outermost shell. It's the valence electrons that are used to bond with other atoms. So they're used to bond with other atoms. So valence is this outer electrons. I hope that you remember how to determine how many valence electrons an atom has. Group one. Now a group goes up and down. So we're talking about group one, which is hydrogen, lithium, sodium, all the way down to francium, that first group on the periodic table. They have one. Group two has two valence electrons. We skip the transition metals. We go to group 13. They have three. Group 14 has 4, group 15 has 5, 16 has 6, group 17 has 7, and finally, the noble gases, group 18, 
They have eight, except for helium, which has only two. Okay, so valence electrons are very important. Elements with the same number, so if they've got the same number of valence electrons, they're gonna have very similar chemical properties. So if they're in the same group or family, they have similar chemical properties because they have the same number of valence electrons. And so that's why we call them families. They behave very similarly in terms of their chemistry. So for example, lithium is going to behave very similar to sodium and potassium and rubidium, all the way down group one. Oxygen behaves very similar to sulfur. Carbon, similar to silicon, and so forth. And that's because they share the same number of valence electrons. We also talked about how these atoms or these elements will combine. They'll form chemical bonds so that they have eight valence electrons. We call that the octet rule. Everyone wants to be like a noble gas. They have eight. So they're going to find somebody on the periodic table and arrange in such a way as if it makes them feel like they have eight. For example, sodium has just one valence electron. Chlorine has seven. And so hopefully you should see why sodium and chlorine really like each other. It's going to come over here and share, or this uh, electron is actually going to transfer over to chlorine, and it's going to feel like they have eight valence electrons between them. Okay, and then finally we, we talked about electron dot structures. This is where you write the chemical symbol for the element. So for carbon, it's C. That represents all the inside and the nucleus of, that, of the atom. And then we put dots on the outside. These dots are the valence electrons. Carbon has four, so we put a dot on top, on the right side, bottom, and left. All right, and so that was a pretty good review of first quarter. Hopefully, that helps you kind of remember what we talked about in first quarter. So what I would like you to do is, with this book that you've made, Use it as, we, as you go through the review process of reviewing for this, the chemistry final and the state final. I want you to use it. Look at it and kind of review the information here. And hopefully this helps you as you go through the review and um, learning chemistry.